This is the R Podcast, Episode 9, Adventures in Data Munging, Part 1. Hi everybody, welcome back to the Art Podcast. Well, let me first just say it's it's great to be back. Actually, it's been a been a long time since the last episode, and I'll get to why in just a second. But um, for those of you that are new to the show, this is the podcast in which we give practical day to day advice on using R to get your data analysis done. And in the previous episodes, we touched on various topics like getting your data into R. And most recently, we touched on creating some innovative visualizations with the uh, ggplot2 um, package back in episode 8. So in this episode, as I mentioned off the top, we're going to take a look at some adventures I've had in what we call data munging, or some will call data pre-processing with some real um, data that I actually used back in episode 8 with the uh, National Hockey League. So yeah, before we get into everything, so to give a little background, this episode was going to be all set to go. I was all set to record about, I would say, three weeks ago. You know, uh, it still was a little late, but I was gearing up, getting everything lined up. I had gotten everything I needed to get this episode going. And then a funny thing happened. Well, it was kind of both expected and unexpected. Well, what happened was is that I haven't talked a lot about my family life here, but um, my wife and I became parents for the first time uh, back a few weeks ago with the birth of our first first child. And um, everybody's doing great. Mother's or my wife's doing very well, although admittedly a bit tired. And uh, the baby's doing great, but. Um, that just threw a complete curveball on a lot of things because he came about three weeks before his due date. So it was a lot of things just kind of went helter skelter there for a bit. And, um, you know, it's a lot of people ask me what it's like. It's basically a brand new world. So I'm learning as I go, so to speak. And, um, hopefully I'll, I'll manage to get by, but, um, so that was uh, that was the biggest reason why this episode didn't get out the, in July like I intended. But um, it, it is great to at least have a spare moment now, finally, to get back to this. Um, so just to appease maybe some concern out there, I'm definitely going to continue on with this show. It's not like I'm going to you know scrap everything at this point. I mean, ideally, I would like to get an episode out you know on a schedule of like you know, at least two episodes a month, if I can manage that, you know, we'll just have to see how things play out, but, um, I'm still getting adjusted to things, but the show is definitely going on, because I have a lot of topics I want to explore and share with all of you in in the future here, so, anyway, that was a, a big event, obviously, and then a couple other things I'll touch on before we get into it, um, some announcements about R itself, where, Recently, there was a new point release, um, version 2.15.1 was released, I believe, back in late June. It's codenamed Roasted Marshmallows, which there may be an inside, you know, reference there that I'm not getting right now. But anyway, um, it's been released, and I think it was mostly kind of a bug fix kind of release. There may have been a few nice features thrown in there. But I'll have a link in the show notes to the actual release notes of of this uh, version 2.15.1 in case you're interested. The other uh, big event that occurred that is now come and gone in the R community was the uh, annual Use R conference for 2012 was recently held here in the United States in the uh, Nashville, Tennessee area. And by all accounts, it looks like it was an excellent conference. And... You know, I'd be lying if I said I really wish, I've, if I, I would really wish I had been there. Actually, it would have been a really cool experience, but I'm sure I'll get my chance later on, and you know, maybe in the next few years or so. 
But anyway, there was some really good discussion, some really nice presentations, and you know, one of the things that really took off is this um, expanded, you know, uh, how should I say, press or buzz around you know, the Knitter package, which is kind of this reboot of Sweeve, only in a lot giving people a lot more flexibility for reproducible analysis or reproducible research, however you want to coin it. And there was some really good uh, discussion there about the package and obviously a lot more than that. And as I was kind of seeing what people thought of the conference, there was a really nice write-up that was done. And I'm going to put a link in the show notes where it was kind of coined a review of the reviews, if you will. And I'll, like I said, I'll have a link to that in the show notes in case you want to get some more details on what what was kind of going down in that conference. So, and then the last thing I'll mention is more administrative, is that starting with this episode, I think we're going to change the uh, format of the show a little bit, where instead of leading off with listener feedback and then getting to the main topic, I'm going to kind of dive into the main topic in the beginning, and then we'll dive into listener feedback afterwards. So... With that, I think it's, let's get right to it. It's time to talk about Adventures in Data Munging, Part 1. Okay, so this this topic I've been meaning to get to, you know, for the past few episodes, actually. And, you know, in hindsight, it may have been better to put this a little before, like, the visualization piece. But with that said... I think it's a good time as any to discuss kind of some of the things I've learned just just through kind of my trials and tribulations, if you will, of importing data that can be, you know, a bit messy in nature and having to kind of clean some things up and getting things ready for actual analysis. So the data I'm talking about is actually the same as in what I used in episode eight where I've been able to access a really nice collection of National Hockey League data, both current and historic, from a website called the Hockey Summary Project. And so I've been able to download uh, all these uh, data files, which are in text format. And what the what the administrators of the site have done is they've they've uh, compressed each um, type of data file within each year as its own kind of compressed the zip archive. So for example, for the latest, like 2012, they have, you know, an archive with all the different type of data that they collected, which is like for the actual games themselves, around player statistics, around things like what uh, penalties occurred and other things like that. They're all kind of broken up into separate files. So what I've done is I basically, once I joined their site, which was the only way I could get access to the data, I basically downloaded all these archives individually and then unpacked them each to their own respective folders. So obviously I am not seeing an effort like this, you know, with with hockey data up to this point. So I do want to, again, extend my thanks to the administrators of this site for making this available free of charge. It's just really cool to have this for somebody who's interested in sports statistics in nature. But um, with, with, you know, when it, with the price of free, you do always have to be cognizant of maybe there is another cost involved. Well, it's kind of time, I would say, because as I got to know these different data files, I kind of noticed there were a lot of inconsistencies even both within a data file itself and then as you pooled the data files across the different years which is exactly what I've been trying to do I in essence want to get data frames or data sets and have it join these different years together for each type of data file so that's the part I'm going to kind of lead off with as I talk about kind of some of the things I've learned with data munging with R, is that one thing I noticed right off the bat is that as I was trying to import these files, which were, again, these text data files using a delimiter of that, um, that pipe symbol on the keyboard, that's just like that vertical line, usually right under a backspace key on the keyboard, 
Well, anyway, I was just doing a simple, you know, read of this file using a function called read.dlim, which I'll actually touch on a little later. And I noticed that there were some times this function was not working at all, where it was saying, in essence, there was nothing to read. And I was thinking to myself, well, that's kind of weird because I downloaded all the years of data. Well, as I looked more closely and I looked at kind of each year individually, just, just a quick check through my file browser, I noticed there were some files that didn't have any size to it, i.e. they were like size of zero bytes. So in essence, what that meant was is, is simply an empty file for that year. So that, of course, causes issues when you want to try and automate the process of bringing all these uh, separate years of data into one type of data frame. So what I had to do is I did a little digging on Stack Overflow and I noticed there were some useful functions to kind of get to know the attributes of any type of external file. And this function was called uh, file.info. And what I was able to do is when you supply an actual file as an argument to that, that function, file.info, it'll actually return to you a, um, I believe it's either a list or a data frame that has certain attributes of that file. Well, luckily, one of those attributes that it gets is the file size. So what I ended up doing is I basically ran this function you know, across all the different years of data for say a particular data file. And I was able to kind of look at, okay, for year like 1999, I was able to subset the data frame return from that to get the size and it would be maybe say 100 bytes or, you know, probably more than that. But anyway, something non-zero. And then as I was looking at different years and feeding all these years kind of as a, as a character vector into this function, I was able to see there were definitely some years that had nothing. So it was a way to kind of automatically check to see what years actually had data and what years really had nothing. So before I go much further, all of the examples of like functions and everything I'm talking about are in the uh, GitHub repository I've uh, developed for NHL analysis, I've called it. And in particular, the stuff I'm talking about right now um, with this uh, file size issue, you can see examples of using file.info in any of the scripts I've created in the data directory. So for example, if you were to open up one of the files called reg.game.r, you'll see, and for those of you listening on the audio, I'm not going to read this verbatim. I'm just going to explain the concept. Um, all I'm doing here is I'm basically getting all those file names via some simple kind of pattern, you know, matching in one of the functions, another useful function called list.files. And then that's after I get that basically a character vector of all the file names of each of these type of data, then what I do is I use that file.info function on all of those files and then as I get this data frame back of all these attributes for each of these years corresponding to the different files then what I was able to do is basically isolate which years had no size and then to to get everything complete I took then another function that was pretty useful to get like differences among vectors and it's called set diff and what I did is I simply used setdiv to compare the vector that contained all of the file paths and file names for every year that was available for this particular data type. And then I compare that to the vector of file names I returned from this file.info subsetting to basically get all of those that were not in, that were not having zero size. So then my final vector of file names was going to be just those that had at least some data in it. That way, at least my autom automated function of importing all of these would not break due to the fact that a file didn't have any size to it. 
So that was just one one issue that I actually I hadn't really encountered before because usually when I get data to analyze an R, it usually has something, but for whatever reason, in this situation, there were some years that just had nothing and they still had the file in there. So there you go. Um, that was kind of the first real issue I had to kind of troubleshoot. Now the other issue is kind of tied to this. It's again, looking at these data files now thinking the situation that I found which files actually have actual data in it. So now the issue I was seeing is that, well, to get a little background, the hockey summary project gives you kind of a readme or a data layout file where it gives you all of the columns you should see in each of these data files, kind of a short, you know, with each a description of the column. And that's, that's excellent. That way I knew what columns were meaning what. And that's especially handy because these files did not have a header inside. Unlike some other data files where, of course, the first row has whatever column names they are. In this situation, they did not. But they gave you this kind of readme or this kind of data layout file to give you that information. So what I did with that is, okay, I was able to get the column names and then I basically put those into a vector in this same script I'm referring to within this data directory. And then as I was trying to import these files and the way I wanted to automate this, I'll kind of touch on an add-on package that really helped this out. First, let me kind of explain the situation again where we have each of these different types of data let's say game data, for example, each year of these was in a separate directory. And what one could do is you could actually just go using the project template package in kind of the automated way, you could in essence make, like put all these data files into that directory, just kind of hunt them down and copy paste them into the data directory and then it might be able to import them automatically. Well, that wasn't gonna really work here because the way these files were delimited, it wasn't like the typical CSV or the tab delimited, it was delimited by this pipe symbol. So I didn't really want to, I didn't really know how to deal with that. Plus I kind of wanted to keep these data files in their own kind of separate area, kind of outside my project area, just because I knew I was going to pull all these together and then save each of these into their own workspace for each type of data file. So the way I've thought about automating this is that, okay, I had this vector of file names for the each for each year of this particular data type. And I wanted to basically have a function that could for each year read that the contents of that year's data file and then in some kind of automated fashion go on to the next year in that vector read in that data but combine the two years together and so on and so on until I had all the years kind of put together into this big data file. So one package that I've used a lot for what they'll call kind of like split apply and combine back together kind of operations is the applier uh, package as developed by Hadley Wickham. And this package can either do things like if you have a data frame and you wanna do something by group, you can then you know, do something by each unique group value that's maybe denoted by a certain grouping variable, do some calculations around it and then put everything back together. Well, this is, a little bit the same way, only now you can think of my group as like each year. So this package has a specific function called ldply, which will basically take something that your input to this is like a list, but a nice little trick is you could also do a character vector as well. You feed that in as your input, and then you can supply your own custom function to do something with each, say, unique value of that group. And then the, the D in the LD ply means you're gonna put everything back together as an actual data frame. So this is exactly what I've been looking for. I want to 
take a, a character vector as input. You could make it a list if you wanted, but not, luckily this function takes either one. Run ldplyy and supply into that a custom function for reading each file and then put it all back together. So on the surface, it seems pretty easy where now the function I would create to kind of put within this, I'll call it file.reader would simply be something that would take each, um, it would use like the read.dlim function with making sure the dlim is that pipe symbol, making sure it knows that there's no header and it's simply being done with that, just using that as like my file reader function. Well, that didn't work. The reason it didn't work is that as I kind of noticed some weird errors about that the column length was not the same as the column names that I was supplying into this read.dlim function. And to get to the chase, what that meant was is that within some of these data files, it would have, say, even more columns than what the data layout told me would be there, or in other cases, sometimes even less columns than what the data layout would tell me. So this, this, this issue took some real kind of thought to get around. And again, I had to go on a, like the forum site stackoverflow.com to kind of see how people read in these data files where maybe certain rows within that data file had more columns than the others. And then if you had sets of these data files, that these columns are not consistent with between each other. So what I was able to dig up was kind of some logic some people use to um, get around this situation using a couple real handy functions. Um, where, let me, I'm actually gonna pull up what I wrote here. Um, I have in the GitHub repository, a directory called lib where I've actually put in these helper functions that I'm gonna be talking about first right now and then as I get to the next issue. So I wrote a function called file.reader where it would take then an input of uh, first the file name, which basically is the full path to the data file I'm trying to read. And then I had an argument for whether the header is there or not, so that was usually false then what was the separator or the delimiter for this file, so in this case the pipe symbol, and then some other um, parameters for like what type of class would I want to give each column and in what column names would I want the data file to have. So what I had to do is I had to use a couple of utility kind of functions to determine for this particular data file how many fields or columns, if you will, what was the maximum possible in that data file? So I kind of chained together a couple functions. I used the function called count.fields, which will basically for each line of the data file, it will count how many columns there are in that particular row. So then you'll get like this vector of like all the the field numbers for each line. Well, while I was interested in finding the maximum of that, so then I just ran max on that count.fields result. So then I knew, okay, that's what this particular data file has for the number of columns. Then what I ended up doing is I figured out, okay, on top of the column classes that I'm feeding into this function, which which would be the number, the number of that would be basically the number of columns I'm expecting in this data file per that data layout um, readme file that was given by the maintainers. I would simply figure out that, okay, I would do a simple subtraction of that max I found in the previous line minus now how many columns that I would expect to see in the data file. So, of course, that could be a positive number if I ended up having more columns in one row than the number of columns I expect, or it could be negative as well. So then I had to do a, a little logic using an if-else kind of statement to say, okay, if the number of fields I'm getting is more 
than the length of the columns that I'm expecting, in other words, the number of columns I'm expecting, then I would simply put in to this column class vector, which by the way, I'm making each column character for reasons I'll explain shortly. I would then, on top of what I had in there already, I would put in a few other values of NA, meaning I didn't know what class they would be. Um, I would rep repeat that for the number of times I had like the number of columns that were detected by this count field versus a number of columns that were actually I was expecting. So that difference. So if I'm expecting like 10 columns and that max of count fields show me there were 13 columns, I would then add like three NAs to that original column class vector. So then I'd have like character 10 times, then I have NA three times. So that's very specific what that would do. And then for the flip side, if I ended up having less columns in the data file than what I expected to see, then I use kind of some kind of vector indexing to basically take away the column classes that were extra in what I supplied into it from what the data file would say. So like um, if the data file had seven columns, but I expected 10 of them, then I would take away the last three columns from my, my column class vector to have only seven values of character instead of 10, like I expected. So that's a mouthful. And then now I'm ready to run that read.dlim function because now I can give it the proper vector of column classes that has the right number of elements because I've checked then whether it had like the actual data file had more than what I expect or less and I was able to get that result into there. So phew, that was a lot. So that in essence is my file.reader function to kind of get to the get a way to automate the um, importing of these data files that within each of these could have more or less columns than what I was expecting to see per the, the data layout kind of guidelines that the project maintainers gave me in that simple readme file. So that's the only way that using ldply worked with read.dlim. I had to basically do this logic to see how many columns I actually have in that data file and then modify my inputs to read.dlim accordingly. So that's a, that's a long-winded explanation and it's easily the first time and I hope the only time I see an issue like this, but now through this experience, I'll be better prepared for it. So the, the last issue I wanna touch on um, is the fact that in the majority of these data files, we'll have a column for the actual team name. And ideally, what you would see and what you would expect to see is that each of these different types of data files, whether it's the game statistics, the player statistics, the goalie statistics, et cetera, et cetera, would have the same team name values from data set to data set. Well, unfortunately, that wasn't the case. Often what you would see is, for example, the team Montreal Canadiens, you would see some data files would call it just Montreal, some would call it Montreal C, some would call it Montreal des Canadiens or something, in other words, like the French version. And I know I butcher that for all of you uh, listeners of the who know French, I don't, anyway. Um, and basically, you would see all these different types of values all associated with that one team, which of course is not what I want because I want to be able to do statistical analysis using team as like a variable or at least some kind of subsetting and it's going to be a pain in the you know what if I have to always think about okay if I want a subset for Montreal I have to always feed in like these five or six representations that the data file had for that team name well the the easy way well, I shouldn't say easy but the the way the to fix this issue 
is to basically recode all of these possible values of each team name that you see in the actual data into a more consistent labeling so that you only have like one unique value for representing the Montreal team. So to do that, there's a real handy function called recode within the, func the package by uh, John Fox called car. Car has nothing to do with, you know, car is an automobile. It stands for um, a, our companion to applied regression, which is an actual textbook that's been written by John Fox. So he abbreviated the package to be car. And it's kind of ironic that the package has a lot, I mean a lot of really useful functions, but I end up just using the recode function most of the time because it's a very easy and intuitive way to basically take all those possible values of say a team name and then recode it into one type of value. And I have a function that does this within my uh, lib directory that script called helpers.r I have a function called recode team and what I'm doing here is I'm basically making this such that for all the data files as I'm munging through it in my munging scripts when I get to a team variable all I'm going to do is recode it using this recode team function that way each data file if it has this team variable will have the same team names across all of them so when you look at this function if you check on my github repository you'll see the way recode works is that the first argument is your vector of what you want to recode so you could do a simple reference to the column for that data frame that has team in it and then you give it a series of kind of pairs where you have on the and with it like on the left side of an equal sign you'll have a, a vector of all the possible values you want to recode so let's take for example the Anaheim team then the data files that I imported in as I kind of explored all of them I saw that they were called like Anaheim A and A all capitals A and A lowercase Anaheim Mighty Ducks like those are like the four values I saw across the board for the Anaheim team so I would have then a vector of just those unique values on the left side then I would say equal and then I would put a simple one element representation within you know a pot within quotes and I would just say Anaheim Ducks so what's that doing is that is taking all those four values that I put and it's recoding them to be Anaheim Ducks. So I do this for each other team in the data file and you'll see that some only have like one value, some will have like four or five, even six or seven values that you have to recode. But putting this in a function gives me a way to easily apply this every time without having to copy paste all these you know, coding pairs these recoding pairs of like team names, what the actual data has versus what I want it to have. And that way it makes the code a lot cleaner to only write this really once and then just use the function each time I wanna do this recoding. So I first do that, I recode all these, what I'll call messy team names into more consistent logical team names. And then on top of that, I have another recoding where I take all those long team names these are like the clean ones now and I recode it to like three letter abbreviations which usually stand for the city sometimes I'll put an initial for the team name too but that way I'll have like a long team name and a short team name so that way no matter how I want to represent team on like say a visualization or a, a table of statistical output I can choose from either the long name or the short name and be assured that it's a clean version and that it'll be consistent with what you would expect to see if you're on, say, a hockey statistics website and what they would call the team. So that was, 
I've had a lot of experience using Recode before, so that really wasn't that difficult for me to do. The only part that, of course, took a little digging was figuring out what are all the possible messy team names that were in all these different types of data files. So I think that's a nice kind of lead in to my wrap up of this segment, which is, you know, what are some useful ways of exploring your data to kind of know what you need to fix and then some nice functions for actually fixing that stuff. So there are a couple of packages uh, I'll, or one other package I'll mention that I'm starting to use a little more with respect to string processing. The package is called string R. So that's spelled S T R I N G R. And that's another package from somebody I mentioned quite a bit on this show, Hadley Wickham. What he's tried to do is he tried to make all the string type operations you do within R in kind of a unified, you know, unified structure to make it a little more intuitive to do string processing. And it's got some really nice functions like trimming, say, white space away from like a each value of a character vector. It does things where you split strings up, you can put strings together, you can extract certain parts of a string. It's a really neat function to explore, and I think it's a really useful package to have for all these uh, data munging efforts that you'll often see as you import data files like these. Some other um, kind of nice uh, tips I have is that let's say you found within your data set or data frame a row that maybe should not be there. Maybe it's totally messy values, maybe it, yeah, or some other criteria you have. Well, there's a pretty easy way to get rid of those is you can kind of use a combination of conditional operators and then some negation. So let me give you an example. In the uh, data frame I was making for the actual game statistics, I noticed that there were some rows in which the team that was in the row was actually called Eastern Conf or Eastern Conference. What this is referring to is this was a game that was actually the all-star game for that particular NHL season. Well, to me, I don't really care about that. I don't want to deal with any all-star statistics. I just want like the regular season games and the playoff games. So... Once I figured out that there were some team names that were called Eastern Conf, then what I could do to get rid of those is do a simple um, kind of chaining of things together where I, I type in the name of my data frame, reg.game, and then within brackets, I'll put an exclamation point, and then I'll say reg.game dollar sign team, and then double equal sign Eastern Conf, quote, end quote, then a comma, and then a closed bracket. What this is doing is you're basically subsetting, in this case, reg.game, to only be the rows where that, that had the team name not be Eastern Conf. So it's a really kind of quick and easy way to get rid of rows that are absolutely being problematic in your data. So I've used that kind of indexing pretty consistently in my in my uh, data munching efforts. So with that said, a couple other things I'll mention is that you'll really want to use functions like um, str to get to know kind of the overall structure of your data frame. And that way you can kind of see maybe there's a column that isn't the same type as what you would expect. You can quickly get each of the column types in the output you can also get a snapshot of what the unique values are. And that leads me into the other function that I would recommend you use is the unique function. Because what you do then is you can feed in, say, a vector into that, and it'll just give you, um, you know, the unique values that you would see in that vector. So if you combine that function with the sort function, then you could get kind of either sorted in the, if it's like a character vector or an alphabetical sort of like say team names that are the only unique ones in that data set. You can obviously do this with numbers as well, but what, what this will often tell me 
is that if I have a column where I only expected to see numbers, and then if I run this chaining of sort, unique, and then whatever that column is, I might see that, hey, wait a minute, there are some character values in there too that frankly shouldn't be there. But it, it just gives you a snapshot of finding those issues before it's you know, getting too late as you go further in your analysis and then you realize, oh, my linear regression's not working because there's a column that is a character, but it should have been a num numeric column and vice versa. So you really need to get to know your columns and one in a data frame and using this uh, unique function is a really useful trick for that. And lastly, another workhorse, workhorse function that I use a lot is the subset function because that way, if you find like a messy value for a particular column, you can just run a quick subset of that data frame and that way you can kind of see how many rows are affected by this and that you might get some ideas after seeing that resulting output of what you want to do with with that data frame to kind of clean it up further. So with with that, that's kind of in a nutshell what I ended up doing from both importing these hockey data files that were again in this text format and then after fixing those issues with the import, then figuring out what did I need to do to kind of clean things up after that. And as I mentioned, please uh, check out my GitHub repository where I have all this stuff kind of documented in the actual scripts. First, that data directory with all the importing. Then I have the lib directory, which it has those two functions I, I explained uh, previously for that uh, file reader and that recode team functions. And then lastly, I have a directory called munge, which actually does kind of the other kind of munging stuff I had to do with these data sets. And I'm sure I'll be explaining even more of those in the next installment of this series. But I'm really looking forward to kind of beefing these up too. And then what I'm actually planning to do with this repository is I may make use of the uh, issues functionality where I'll kind of document some of the issues I've seen with either analyzing these data or any other you know issue I have. And that way you, the community, can kind of see how I've either resolved it or even in the case where I don't have a solution, maybe we can all put our heads together and figure out the best way to get a solution for some of these uh, issues with, with analyzing these data. So um, like I said, I'm really looking forward to getting further on in this analysis because up to this point, other than the visualizations I did in the previous episode, my efforts have all been on this kind of data importing and data cleaning side of things. So there's, uh, there's obviously a lot more I want to do. So we'll hopefully get to that, you know, very soon. And one thing I'll kind of lead off with as I think about what we'll talk about in the next episode on this series is there's actually another website that has similar data as the Hockey Summary Project. In fact, I think they use that site as a source of their data, but unlike them, they put their data in kind of web HTML table format. And the nice thing about it is, is they made it very consistent with like finding what link goes to what. Like It's like a logical path to each particular data table that they have on the website. So I began to develop some code to actually scrape the data from this website and put it into my kind of collection of hockey data because once I figured out how to scrape that data off the web, it actually was a lot cleaner than what I saw from the hockey summary project. The only downside is, is that it doesn't have quite as much data as the hockey summary project. So where I'm going with this is I'm gonna to have to kind of merge all of this together at some point. So I'm kind of going through this exercise of figuring out what do I want from the this website, which is called hockeyreference.com. And how, what do I wanna take from that and what I wanna merge with in the case of the hockey summary project. So there's a lot more to do, but I'm really looking forward to it because it's kind of a, this project of looking at these data has like all the facets of using R in every stage of like a statistical analysis. So I'm really 
kind of excited to see this through. So yeah, I think um, that that was a that about covers what I wanted to talk about with this uh, data munging first installment. So now let's go ahead and get to some listener feedback. Message for you, son. All right, our first uh, piece of feedback uh, from email actually directly ties into the topic today, uh, and it comes from Daniel. And Daniel says, Hi, Eric. I, too, come from a bioscience background, but I now work mostly with marketing databases. My workhorse has always been SPSS, but I'm now making the move towards R and Python. I am very excited with the possibilities presented by R, my main sticking point with R at the moment is munging. Munging is probably 80% of what I do at work, and my main motivation to learn Python and R is to automate the process of cleaning the data and creating simple frequency tables with it. For me, it is useless to know how to plot if I cannot first deal with first finding errors and either deleting faulting ro- faulty rows or updating it. Second, converting variable types and applying list-wise transformations, i.e. deleting leading dollar sign characters in currency value columns. Third, creating tables, i.e. Excel-like pivot tables or SPSS-like custom tables that can display either a number of cases or sum of values or whatever transformation. Four, selecting the cases I want displayed in such tables i.e. include cases marked with group 1 and group 2 in column A, but not cases marked group 3. Once I get the data in shape, then yes, I can go forward and plot bar graphs for group 1 and group 2. I am really struggling with finding that information on my own at the moment. I would really enjoy if you could dedicate some of your airtime for giving some leads that I and others could follow. And thanks for making my commuting time enjoyable. Cheers, Daniel. So Daniel, thanks a lot for that feedback, and I'm I'm really glad you you sent that in because, like I said, this this goes hand in hand with what I've been talking about in this episode. So I'll kind of kind of hit your points with what I would recommend going forward. So for your first point about finding those errors and perhaps deleting those rows, that's exactly what I was talking about when I was saying getting rid of those uh, rows in the game data with like the team name of Eastern Conference. You'll just want to use that kind of logic where you use basically indexing of that data frame, but you're using a combination of a conditional statement and then the negation symbol in front, i.e. the exclamation point, to get rid of those rows. So that I would definitely explore that and you will see examples of like that logic one website I would definitely check out is the um, Quick R site because they have a nice section on kind of the data importing and other data kind of munging operations where they have you know specific examples of what I'm talking about. And then to other things like converting variable types, you'll definitely want to use the functions like, for example, as dot character or as dot numeric or as dot factor to convert maybe a column from one type to another that fits your particular needs. And uh, also you would definitely want to check out using um, some combination of these if you wanted to convert a bunch of these together in kind of one batch way. Um, One, in fact, what I'm digging up now is in one of my munging scripts, I remember doing this same sort of thing with converting certain column types to be integer but without having to do all of them one by one. I kind of chained a couple things together. So if you want to check out my GitHub repository in particular for the NHL analysis, go into the munch directory and check out the um, script called 04 or 04 reg stat preprocessing. What you're going to see there is I have a, a simple function I created called like integer converter where all I'm doing is I'm taking an argument of x and I'm saying make that as dot integer of x 
So in other words, I'm just applying the as.integer function. So why did I make a function to do something that we already have a function for? Well, because there are multiple columns that I wanted to convert to integer, and because I'm, I'll be a little lazy and not wanting to type this for each column that I wanted to do because it ended up being about, looks like about at least 12 columns I wanted to convert to integer. I basically put all the columns I wanted to convert, all the names of those into a character vector. So I have things like game ID, you know, face off losses, etc. And then what I'm doing is I'm now gonna take just another indexing of, in this case, reg.stats, which is like my data frame with, uh, with all the columns. I'm gonna subset that to just get the columns I want to convert from that character vector. And then I'm gonna use the function called lapply, where lapply, what it will do is it'll apply a function either built into R or one that you created yourself on all the different parts of a list. Well, here's the kicker. A data frame is a special type of list. So in other words, if I just put in an L apply as the first argument, I put in reg.stats, but with the bracket of column cows to convert, and then close bracket, that's saying, okay, apply this function that I'm gonna put next to each column that I put in this subset of data frame. So then my next argument is simply the reference to that function called integer.converter. This is exactly what you're talking about. This is now converting all those particular columns that were character before, but I know just from nature of the data, they should be integers. I'm doing that for each of those columns in one line, instead of doing it line by line by line for each individual column. So you'll want to get to know those kind of suite of like ply functions, in this case L apply, but there are other ones as well. And then also you'll want to check out that package I referenced earlier called the plier package. The reason for that is it is a perfect way for you to get those kind of summary tables that you're looking for because you could easily for like certain groups of rows in your data file get like a summary of like the number of values you have there. Or like you said, you could get a sum of those values, maybe an average, whatever have you, it doesn't matter. It'll, it'll take all those statistics you calculate for each group and it'll put it all back together. And in particular, the way you'd wanna do that is using the ddplot function, which is taking a data frame as input and then outputting you another data frame they could easily, you know, print out or just, you know, explore, which would be the summaries that you're looking for. And then for your last point about selecting the cases you want, again, the subset function is by far probably the most intuitive way to do that. So definitely check out the uh, help page for that. And it's got some good examples there because I use that basically in almost any data analysis I do with R as I'm getting to know the data and I wanna you know, see certain rows or certain columns, that one's by far the easiest function to do. So I certainly hope that helps, helps you out, Daniel. And I think once you practice this, using some of the stuff I've done in this, I've uh, talked about in this episode, and again, I would check out like the Quick R uh, website as well. That's in my uh, resources page, by the way, on the R Podcast home site you'll definitely want to you know, check that out, invest some time in reading that. And by the way, the author of that website does have his own book, I think currently in press right now too. So go to his website to check out you know, more details on that. And then um, Daniel also mentioned, I think in a separate message, the uh, project template package, which uh, I would invite you to check out um, episode seven, where I talk about that package in a lot more detail. And I think, um, like me, you'll see that that package is really helpful to kind of integrate my um, code together for certain projects and automate certain things that, you know, would be a little more painful otherwise. So we're going to conclude this uh, segment of listener feedback with actually um, an audio contribution. And um, in the previous um, episode, um, uh, listener Fran said, you know, sent in about a short uh, segment 
with his uh, audio feedback. Well, I took him up on his offer of, um, you know, supplying another segment talking about what we call the pitfalls of using R. So without further ado, here is uh, Franz's take on the pitfalls of R. Hey guys, welcome to the pitfall segment. First of all, I would like to thank Eric for giving me the opportunity to do this. Preparing for this was even more fun than I thought and uh, I also learned a few new things uh, while preparing for this. Um, this pitfall segment is all about dates, about explicit information. But uh, don't worry, I will try my best to keep it safe for work. So when you do data analysis, you are likely to run into data that contains timestamps. And uh, with timestamp, I mean a calendar date or a calendar date combined with uh, time of day or just time of day. R has a number of types to uh, represent timestamps internally. The three main types are uh, POSIX LT, POSIX CT and uh, date. POSIX-LT is uh, one that gives convenient access to the different parts of a timestamp. POSIX-CT is a, a compact form that uh, you can use to store many timestamps uh, at once. And a date is just for dates. It also has uh, functions to convert from and to these types. The one you will be using most often uh, implicitly or explicitly are STR P time and STR F time. Now let's focus on STR P time. STR P time parses text. Your raw data usually contains timestamp information in the form of a text string. Now humans have come up with very, very, very many ways to specify a point in time. For instance, uh, the day of the month as a number, the month as a number, and then followed by the year as a number, and then followed by the time of the day. Or if you're American, first the month, then the day, then the year. Sometimes the name of the month is given as a number, sometimes it is uh, abbreviated, or sometimes the full name is given of a month. Or if you ESO minded, you might first write the year, then the month, and then the day, which actually sorts very well. You can parse all these different formats with STR P time. You tell it what your timestamp looks like, and it parses it and returns an object of the type POST6LT. You tell it the format of your timestamp by giving it a format string. In this format string you specify the order and the type of the different fields in your timestamp. The field specification starts with a percent followed by a letter. For instance, to specify an American style date you would write percent %m, percent %d, percent %y. There's uh, many, many field specifiers and uh, have a look at the help page for this function and uh, you will see it's a sort of a mini programming languages. One of these field specifiers uh, allow you to specify a time zone of your data. Usually this is a four digit number uh, preceded by a sign, for instance, uh, plus zero one zero zero which would indicate that you are one hour away from UTC. And UTC is a universal time coordinated, which would mean that you're living uh, somewhere in Europe, depending on uh, whether there's daylight saving or not. You can also optionally specify a time zone name while uh, converting using the TZ variable. Well, that's TZ with uh, small caps. You could even do both, but uh, that's much like crossing the streams in uh, the Ghostbusters. Anyhow, the ability to specify time zones leads us straight into our first pitfall. Your 
timestamp data is converted using the time zone info you specify in the percent %z field of your timestamp or by the name of the time zone that you specified in the tz variable your timestamp data is stored together with the time zone you specified in the tz variable which is optional however your data is displayed in your current time zone well some of the time if you if you plot your data with ggplot it is always shown in your current time zone if you plot your data with the plot function it depends on whether you use the tz variable during conversion if you print timestamps using the strf time function by default it shows it in your current time zone unless you specify a tz variable the same function that's a strf time is used by many other functions that display information so most of the time your converted timestamps are shown in your time zone and not in the time zone of your raw data sometimes this is what you want and sometimes it is not let me give you an example say you live in the US and you have a colleague living in Australia she did some interesting experiment and she needs your help analyzing the data she sends you the data with timestamps that are in the EST time zone you analyze it and make a nice plot with ggplot you color up and say well I see this strange spike at 12 o'clock in your data then you better tell her that it is 12 o'clock your time or she might go on a wild goose chase trying to figure out what happened during her experiment at 12 o'clock her time now if you think you can get around this by just stripping off the time zone information and pretending the whole experiment took place in your time zone you'll be bitten by a different problem this is daylight savings daylight savings differs all over the planet some countries have it some countries don't in some countries it starts in a, at a different time than other countries what this all means is that there are some timestamps that are possible in one time zone but not in another time zone for instance the timestamps between 2 and 3 a.m on the day the clock is set one hour ahead for daylight savings if you try to convert these you will end up with NAs in your data now you might say well that's all nice and dandy France but why would I care I don't even have a colleague in Australia to which I would say well you might have without even knowing it for instance you might have a system that records data with UTC timestamps some medical devices do this and uh, some computer log files will have these too this uh, happened to me um, we have a system at work that records the performance of uh, computer clusters it records some 300 variables minute by minute and all the timestamps are in GMT format I used R to analyze the data and make some nice plots I saw some odd peaks at 2 o'clock at night so I went back to the log files to see what happened around that time but I could not find anything odd at 2 o'clock but that was because that 2 o'clock was 2 o'clock CET which corresponds to 1 o'clock GMT so I was looking at the wrong part of the data now how can we solve this um, one way to solve this is uh, I found is to put R in the same time zone as your data under uh, Linux and uh, probably Apple II this is uh, pretty easy for this you have to start R or if you're using R Studio, R Studio from the command line but before you do this you set the environment variable tz that's tz with all capitals and that's uh, different from the tz variable we discussed before because that's the tz variable inside r this is a tz variable that is a environment variable of the operating system under linux you would execute export tz equals and then the name of the time zone of your data for instance i would have used export tz is gmt then you start R 
and now R will think it is in the GMT time zone and do all time related computations in this time zone there'll be no conversion back and forth from one time zone to the other time zone because your raw data and R are all in the same time zone any printed or plotted timestamps correspond to the timestamps in your raw data which makes it much easier to find points of interest okay this was the first pitfall i uh, hope you find it useful and uh, can use this information to uh, avoid this pitfall in the future okay um next segment we'll have some uh, more time related pitfalls and uh, we'll be analyzing the population of new york and uh, have a script that fails one day of the year um well see you next time bye, -bye. All right. Well, thank you very much, Franz. That was some really nice uh, material there. And actually, Franz emailed me, you know, afterwards with a link to his uh, his blog where he actually talks about this in a lot of detail as well. So I'll have that link in the show notes. So as I mentioned in previous episodes, I really like getting that audio feedback. It just it was, there's just something really cool about it. So if you've been looking to contribute to the show, uh, don't hesitate to you know, make a short recording and uh, record it in whatever software you'd like and uh, just send me an attachment via email. Um, or you could also use the uh, voicemail hotline as well if you want to directly uh, leave a message on there. Um, I really like getting that feedback. So thanks a lot, Franz. Um, so with that, I think we're going to kind of put a bow on this episode. So um, definitely uh, please uh, stay subscribed to our um, podcast feed on our on our home site r-podcast.org where we have the custom feeds for the audio as well as the uh, screencast episodes and if you are a listener on iTunes and you've really been enjoying the show I would um, you know ask you kindly to maybe perhaps leave a review for us on there because that any feedback we get for the show is really appreciated and I'm really hoping to kind of spread the word on what we're trying to do on the R podcast. And any any feedback usually helps. So um, also you can get some updates on the new episodes on our um, Twitter handle, which is at the R cast. Also, definitely check out our um, Google Plus page where we have a direct link on the home site, r-podcast.org. And I'll definitely be perusing that from time to time and feel free to leave some feedback there. And also definitely uh, check out the forums on the home site as well. If you want to make a comment on a specific episode or any other topics we have in the forums, please do so. I really enjoy seeing those messages. And so with that, well, that was a jam-packed episode, uh, but I think it's well worth it with the time we had away. So um, hope you um, guys have a, have a great rest of the, the week or whenever you're listening to this. So, until next time. End of line.